Praise the Lord. Church, if you are there, I said, Praise the Lord. The Lord be with you. And the Lord strengthen you. And the Lord give you courage, fortitude, stamina, backbone to do everything God has called you to do this year in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the workers training tonight. Lord, we pray that as you present your word to us, your word will strengthen everyone in Jesus' name. Give courage to everyone. Confidence of faith to everyone. That everything you want us to do, without looking back, without compromising, Without being fearful, we do everything to the glory of your name in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles. I'm reading from chapter 20, verse 20. Acts, chapter 20. I'm reading verse 20. And now I kept nothing back that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house. Once again, this is 2020. And the year 2020 will mean a great fulfillment in every life. A great progress in every life. Forward march and forward movement in Jesus' name. And so as we come to this uh, workers training, this uh, January, I'm presenting this to you as the 2020 vision of renewed workers. It's good to be a worker working with the Lord. It's wonderful to be a worker walking alongside the Lord. And he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And what he would have been doing if he were here, that's what he wants us to do. That's why I'm presenting this to you, what will Christ have done. Read this, chapter 20, verse 20, with the understanding of what Christ would have been doing. How? I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. He could have told his disciples that everything profitable to them in their spirit, in their soul, in their body, everything profitable to them in their calling, he had shown unto them how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. And I've showed you and I've taught you publicly in all those public gatherings, he revealed to them his mind, revealed to them his word, revealed to them what it takes for somebody to get into life eternal. And then he says, from house to house. When he got into the house, the disciples asked him, what did you mean by this? What did you mean by this? And in the house, he explained everything to them. And the Lord is calling us to the same thing. That what's profitable for the members of the church, what's profitable for every family in the church, what's profitable for every worker, every minister, will preach publicly. And then from house to house in the house fellowship, we emph emphasize the same thing. Come back to 2020, Acts of the Apostles, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. This Paul the Apostle now talking to the church, talking to the ministers of the church and the members of the church. He said, you've seen my ministry and you've seen my declaration and you have observed everything I've taught you. I taught you publicly and I taught you privately. I taught you from house to house and I never kept anything back that was profitable unto you. Is it repentance? I taught you. Restitution? 
having a clear conscience between God, for God, before God and man, I taught you righteousness, the holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I taught you sanctification. I taught you Holy Ghost baptism. I even asked the other church in the previous chapter, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? I taught you everything. How? I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. But I have showed you, and I have taught you publicly, and from house to house, testify both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing uh, the things that shall befall me there. In verse 24, but none of these things move me. He said he wasn't looking at persecution, at difficulties, at danger, and then holding back. If I say that, I'll be persecuted. If I teach that, they'll jump on me. If I show them the way, the only way that goes to heaven, the way of holiness, the highway of holiness, some of them might not agree. He said, no, not at all. Whatever the situation and whatever the condition of the people and whatever the threats, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself that I might finish my cause with joy. What's the cause? Declaring the totality of the word of God. What's the cause? Declaring the way of salvation plain and clear was the cause declaring the life that a child of God ought to live so that he'll be ready for the coming of the Lord. It says, so that I might finish my cause with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord. The ministry which I have received of the Lord. He said, I got this from the Lord. And because I got it from the Lord, I am answerable unto him. I'm responsible unto him. And I will give an account unto him in the final day. I say, and he says, and to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Verse 26, wherefore, I take you to record this name, that I am pure from the blood of all men. Why did he say that? How could he say that? If he met somebody who should repent, and he didn't tell him of repentance, he'll be guilty of that person's blood. If you met somebody who should do restitution, and restitution is, you know, in every area of life, not only marriage, marriage restitution, family restitution, society, um, the, your company's uh, restitution, you've taken something that doesn't belong to you, and you say you're coming to church, restitution, to make sure that you live a right, a, a life that is part of, of offense toward God and toward man. He said, I am pure from the blood of all men. Why? Verse 27. For I have not shown to declare unto you all the counsel of God. All the counsel of God. All the counsel of God. I've declared unto you. He has shown us what? A 2020 vision of a worker, of a minister, of a preacher, of a pastor ought to be. Verse 28. Take each therefore. Therefore, as I have done it, as I have shown you, as I have exposed it to you, therefore yourself take it unto yourselves and to all the flock, all the flock, don't be guilty of the blood of anyone. Don't be guilty of making anyone to be careless in their lives and to be negligent in their lives. All the flock, the young people, the children, the men, the women, the high and the low, everyone, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood, which he has purchased with with his own blood, verse 31, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone, to warn everyone. 
That's how he wasn't guilty of their blood. That's how he preserved his own life. That's how he preserved his own calling. Because he warned everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. That's why I was preaching the word, because the word will build them up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Vision, the 2020 vision of renewed workers. We're looking at Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, the life of the apostle Paul, his conversion, his calling to the ministry. The life of the Apostle Paul and the ministry of the Apostle also originated with a great vision the Lord revealed. I'm looking at Acts chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision. Said the Lord in a vision. Think about it. If Ananias had not received the vision he received about going to Saul, if Ananias had disobeyed the vision that he received going to Saul, if Ananias had been afraid of heard of that man, an injurious man, a murderer, a terrible man, a persecutor, and the vision he received, he did not follow through because of the fear of man. Think of what would have happened. Paul would not have been reached, and all that he did, he could not have done. But it says, Ananias, and he said, Behold, here I am, Lord. I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed. That's what you call word of knowledge. The Lord gave him knowledge as to what Saul was doing and where Saul was and how to get to Saul and how to minister unto Saul in a vision. We need to have the 2020 vision, a vision that leads us to people, a vision that makes us to preach repentance, a vision that makes us to tell people what they ought to do and how they ought to straighten out their lives so that they will be acceptable unto the Lord. In verse 12, and as seen in a vision, even Saul, who was praying, had seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive a sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel. All this nation that Ananias received, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him, I'll keep on revealing myself to him, I'll keep on showing him vision. As I show him this vision and he runs with it, I show him another vision and he runs with that, I show him another vision and, I, and he runs with that. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way on the strength of that vision. And Ananias went his way in obedience to that vision. And Ananias went his way, not minding the cause, because of that vision. And he entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from him, from his eyes, as it were, as it had been scales, 
and he received sight the fourth ways and arose and he was baptized baptized in water and also it says and when he had received meat he was trending then said so, then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus look at verse 20 and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God all that as a result of the vision you see there are people who are called Christians they've never seen any vision of the Lord they don't have any conviction of the Lord they don't have any inspiration from the Lord to say do this or do this or do that and their lives do not match the calling of a Christian there are many workers they come to workers training and they listen to all these messages but there is no opening of their eyes the opening of their mind they are there as the people are there but well, because there's no vision because there's no illumination because there's no inspiration they are the way they have always been i pray you have a vision of the lord a conviction from the lord and the power of the lord will move you on to do what he has ordained for you to do in jesus name amen acts of the apostles chapter 10 i'm reading from verse 19 acts chapter 10 verse 19 while peter thought on the vision you see that for peter to go to the house of cornelius he had a vision without that vision he would never have gone he even argued for that vision he said how can i do that i've never done something like that before the point is you need an opening of your eyes in the sight of the lord so you have real vision you'll not just be the way you were just push, pushing on and just there and you're doing the best you can but really there is no inspiration from within while peter thought on the vision the spirit said unto him behold three men seek thee arise therefore in a vision the spirit of the lord talking to him arise therefore and get thee down and go with them doubting nothing for i have sent them he responded to that vision he got to the house of cornelius he saw the people sitting he began to talk to them look at verse 44 while peter yet speak these words the holy ghost fell on all them that heard the word that the result of following the vision and this year even from today the lord will impact every heart and the lord will inspire everyone and the lord will illuminate and enlighten the heart of everyone in jesus name looks like you are not waiting for a vision the 2020 vision of renewed workers you'll renew your heart you'll renew your mind you'll renew your focus He'll renew your understanding. He'll renew the calling that he has given you. And it is that renewal, it is that revival, it is that brightening of the vision that makes us to rise up and then do what needs to be done so that souls can be saved. The 2020 vision of renewed workers. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the vision of valiant workers valiant workers those who are valiant for the truth they're courageous for the truth they're courageous for the knowledge of the truth of the word of god they are hearing they have a vision and that vision makes them courageous and makes them valiant makes them to conquer the vision of valiant workers point number two the vanity of visionless workmen visionless workmen there are people who work in this life maybe they are working on a building but they are just recruited to be hands-on people 
and they do not have the vision of what the building will look like when it's finished. They do not have the vision of the use of that building when it's finished. To them, building that mansion or building that sanctuary is similar to building any hut or any ramshackle thing anywhere. They are just called there and they are there just to have their hands occupied. There's no vision. There's no understanding of what the result will be when they finish what they're doing. Little, little things will judge them. Little, little things will distract them. Little, little things will discourage them. And they become vain. Point number two, the vanity of visionless workmen. Visionless watch, workmen. Number three, the vocation. The vocation. This is the occupation now that you deal with pleasure. The occupation will deal with excitement. The occupation you seek all you have, all your skill, all your heart, all your life into. Because you know there is something at the end of this. The vocation of virtuous watchmen. The vocation of virtuous watchmen. Point number one, the vision of valiant workers. We're coming to Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2. We're looking at verse 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. Reading here from verse 2. You see what the Lord is saying here. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. When you see the vision, when Christ has given you the vision, when the Holy Ghost has painted the vision before you, when he has shown you the people to reach, how to reach them, why you are reaching them, why you are going to them, why you are preaching the word of God to them, and you write that vision, you make it plain, you make it clear, you make it arresting, that anybody that reads it, anybody that hears it, that thing will arrest him and move him and push him to serve the Lord, that he may run the tree that it. Have you ever received inspiration while the message is going on at a retreat, at a congress, at a Bible study, at a revival hour, at a Saturday workers' training meeting, at a Tuesday leadership development session, and the thing struck you, and the Lord showed you, here is what you do. Did you write it down? Did you read it over and over? Did you think about it? Did you meditate on it? Did you so pray about it that that thing become an anchor to your ministry? And that every time you go over and over again, that you run with the vision while you are reading it. And anything happening contrary to that vision, contrary to that illumination, will not matter to you at all. Anything you hear, anything you see, will not matter because you have a vision. A vision that is written. A vision that is clear. A vision that is plain. A vision that you know that this is coming from the Lord. It's not brother so-and-so who has given me the vision. And so whatever brother so-and-so does, that's not going to discourage me. It's not madam so-and-so, sister so-and-so who has given me the vision. So whatever madam and whatever sister so-and-so does will not matter at all to me. The Lord has given me this. And because I'm looking at the vision, not looking at them, because I'm meditating on the vision, not meditating on persecution, because I am running, I am running, running with the vision. It will not matter at all what anybody says and what anybody does. You have a vision. I pray that that vision will be brighter today. In Ezekiel chapter 3, Ezekiel chapter 3, I'm reading here from verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 3. We're reading from verse 1. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, each that thou findest, and each this room, 
and go speak unto the house of Israel. This was in a vision. And the Lord presented to him the word. The Lord presented to him the commission. The Lord presented to him the ministry, the occupation, what he was to do from now on his life, the priority of what you do, the precedence of what he's going to do, and the preeminence of what he's going to do. The number one thing that must be on his side, waking up in the morning, or walking through the day, or before resting and relaxing in the evening, and all through the days of the year, all the years of his life, the Lord was giving him what he will do that will make his being alive a fulfillment. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, till and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. You'll not ingest, digest any other thing. You will not meditate or think on any other thing. This vision, this word, this ministry, this commission that I commit into your hand, this will be your waking thought. And this will be your sleeping meditation. This will be everything you are thinking about during the day. And this will be what you are thinking about during the night. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, chapter 3, verse 17, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman. With this vision I reveal to you, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth. And give them warning from me. Hear the words at my mouth. It's not what they want to hear. It's what I give you to say. That's what you say. And they will hear. You'll give them warning from me. What I say unto the wicked. That shall surely die. And thou givest him not warning. Nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way. To save his life. You see, it was to preach for the salvation of the people. Coming with repentance and faith in the Lord. Coming with repentance and conversion of life. Coming with repentance and forgiveness and freedom from sin. If you do not want them and give them the message that will save them, that will convert them, that will make them turn totally unto the Lord, and turn away from sin, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand. You will be insecure if you don't do my will. You will not be able to secure your soul and secure your destiny if you don't do my will. Yet, if thou warn the wicked and he turn not from his wickedness, not from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou shalt deliver thy soul. Again, when a righteous man does turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die because thou hast not given him warning. You see the two sides of the ministry of Ezekiel and the two sides of our ministry as we carry out the vision to the world evangelization and to the church, the righteous edification that those who are in sin were warning them, were preaching to them, were telling them about repentance, were telling them about coming to know the Lord, were telling them how to escape the judgment of God. And those who are already saved and are righteous in the church were telling them not to be careless, not to take the grace of God for granted, not to bite the finger that feeds them, and not to disregard the Lord or to rebel against the Lord. It says, we warn the world and we warn the church. It says, but when a righteous man does turn, 
from his righteousness and commit iniquity. And I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning. Because you see, he saved. He has the Bible to read. He saved. The Spirit of God lives in his heart. He saved. He's a child of God. He will not say he does not know the truth. I don't need to labor on him if you don't fulfill your responsibility. And that righteous man goes back into sin. The soul that sinned, it shall die. It shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Verse 21. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man, that the righteous sin not, and he does not sin. You warn him, and he takes the warning to heart. You preach to him about righteousness, and judgment to come, and he fears the judgment to come, and he abides in righteousness, and he sinneth not. You warn him, you encourage him, you lead him to pray, and he prays and gets more of the grace of God. And he does not go back into evil. He shall surely live. Because he is warned also that was delivered thy soul. I pray the vision the Lord has given us will abide by that vision. You will abide by the vision. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, reading from verse 9. Acts chapter 18, verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. The Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. I thought he had seen the vision of the Lord before years. I thought he had been working for the Lord even before this time, yes. He had been working for the Lord. But you know, sometimes the fire may be going down. Sometimes discouragement may be coming. Sometimes you may get used to the work that you just do it now from day to day without any new zeal, any new strength, any new focus, any new consecration, any new devotion. And so because of that, not to allow him to go lukewarm or to become cold, the Lord spoke to him again in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. Be not afraid. You know, if the Lord tells you not to be afraid, and then you are afraid of a man, of a woman, you're making that man your God. Higher than God, greater than God, stronger than God. God said, fear not. God said, be not afraid. God said, go to the people I'm sending you to. And be not afraid of their faces. If you are still afraid, you have an idol. You make them idols. You fear them. You think they can do something against you that God... God cannot reverse. You make yourself an unbeliever. You'll not be an unbeliever. You'll not fear man. You'll not fear woman. You'll not fear anyone in the world in Jesus' name. Be not afraid, but speak. If you're not speaking, you're afraid. If you're not witnessing, you're afraid. If you're not preaching the word of God, you're afraid. If you're not warning sinners, you are afraid. If you're not talking to your relatives about, about Christ, you are afraid. If you cannot even talk to your husband about what it takes to get to heaven, you are afraid. If you're not talking to your wife, you are afraid. If you're not talking to your children, and you're not showing them the way that leads to life eternal, you are afraid. If you're not talking to members of the church and showing them, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, you are afraid. If you're afraid of man, 
and you're not doing what God has told you to do, that's the way of perdition. I pray you will turn around. You will not be afraid. Amen. And as you will not be afraid, the Lord will give you the strength and the power. You'll do everything the Lord has called you to do in Jesus' name. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. Any amen there? I am with thee. You know, there are people that say, you know, those people of dark powers, they're there. Those people that can persecute you, they are there. Those people that can snuff out your life, they are there. Those people that can derail you, they are there. But you don't believe that God is nearer? God says he's with you. If God is with you, who can be against you? They will all become nothing in Jesus' name. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. Paul the Apostle was the only one that the Lord had committed their salvation into his hands. He said, stay there, preach the word, speak unto them, be not afraid. I have much people in this city. And he continued there, and he continued there, and he continued there, you'll continue there. Preaching the word, you'll continue. Showing the way of the Lord, you'll continue. Standing firm and standing courageously, you will continue. Standing with conviction and backbone, you will continue. You'll continue in Jesus' name. Now, before I go away from that point one, there's something also I need to show you. And it's in 1 Samuel chapter 14. For Samuel chapter 14, I'm reading from the last verse there. For Samuel chapter 14, we're reading from the last verse there. That is verse 52. And there was so war against the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him unto him. There was war. And the Philistines had not all, all, all been exterminated. They had not all been defeated. De defeated some and some still remained. Defeated some and some still remained. Defeated others and some still remained. And Saul knew the war must continue. We're evangelizing. We're doing the work of the Lord. And then sinners still remain. We're preaching the gospel. And those who are not saved, we know them, they still remain in our community. We're warring against Satan and against the flesh and against the world. And yet, the world has not totally been conquered for Christ. Therefore, like Saul did, he saw any strong man, any valiant man, he took him unto him. If you are valiant, you surround yourself with valiant people. If you are a preacher, a good preacher, a preacher of the Son Word of God, a preacher of righteousness, a preacher of salvation, a preacher of the gospel, you will surround yourself with valiant men who will do the same. You will not surround yourself with people who are not valiant for the truth. We're coming to Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9. We're looking at verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 3. They bend their tongues like their bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. They proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, says the Lord. The work needs valiant men and valiant women, valiant workers, valiant workmen, valiant witnesses, valiant soul winners, valiant men and women that stand for the truth. And like Saul did in his good days, 
he saw any valiant man, any strong man, he took him unto himself. You are valiant, attract other valiant people, other valiant workers, and drill them, disciple them, train them, transform them, and put them to the work. But those who bend their tongues for lies and are not valiant for the truth upon the earth, they will not be part of your team. They will not be part of my team. Say it for yourself, they will not be part of my team. Say it for yourself, they will not be part of my team. You will not surround yourself with compromisers in Jesus' name. Weak need people. And the people who don't have any backbone, the people who are not strong, who are not valiant for the truth, they will not be part of your team in Jesus' name. Point number two now, the vanity of visionless workmen. The vanity of visionless workmen. We're coming to Proverbs chapter 29. And I'm reading from verse 18. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. For many years was Moses in the wilderness, and he was just at the backside of the desert. They'll come, go back home to Jethro. Come, go back to Jethro. One year is gone, ten years gone, twenty years gone, thirty-nine years gone. Then on one day, after 40 years in the wilderness, he now saw a vision of the bunny bush, and it was not consumed. He said, I must turn aside and see what is happening here. When he saw that vision, and he took interest in that vision, and he turned around and began to look at that, then the Lord said, Moses, Moses, the Lord will call your name. And when he calls your name, it will show you the vision of what you ought to do for your life business. And when he shows you, you will do it in Jesus' name. For many years, at um, other people like David, take care of the sheep, take care of this, until seeing the vision when God saw him and called him. I about Daniel, I about Paul, Saul of Tarsus. It was when they saw that vision of the Lord that they rose up now and they started life as if they are just coming into life today. The same thing with you. You'll be in the church like many other people. I'm a member of the church. What are you doing? Nothing. No vision. You're just in the church. I'm part of the church. What did you do before? Like last year, that's what I did. What are you doing now? Of course, what I did last year, there's no new vision. There's no new excitement. There's no new enthusiasm. There's no new interest as it was. So it is. And until you see the vision of the Lord, life will continue the way it has always been. There will be no plan. There will be no forward movement. There will be no progress. I pray the Lord will reveal himself unto you. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Israel would have perished if there wasn't any vision. And Israel would have been defeated, even in Canaan, if there was no vision that Joshua saw. He saw that captain of the host of the Lord. And when he saw that vision, he said, Are you for us or for our enemies? He said, I am sent by the Lord. It's when you see that vision... Your life will take on a new strength, a new power, a new energy, a new fulfillment and progress in Jesus' name. My heart goes out to the people that are just coming to church and are just coming to the workers' train, and yet they are not better today than they were yesterday. There's no vision. There's no valiancy. 
and there is no strength and there is no power and there is no progress, things will change this year in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Proverbs chapter 12, verse 11. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 11. He that healeth his land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that followeth vain persons, he that followeth vain persons, is void of understanding. Following vain persons, sometimes you see a long queue. Somebody is in the front and is walking. The person behind him thinks he knows the way and is following. And the person behind that thinks they know the way and is following. And by the time you come to the last end of that queue, and you ask, you say, why are you lining up? Why are you here? Oh, is this as a person in my front? You ask the next person, why are you here? Why are you lining up? Well, as a person in my front. And as you go on, they're just following until somebody will come out of that queue and then uh, go beside them. And you see that the one in front is like a lost man. He doesn't know his way. And the people are following. He that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. You'll not follow vanity. You don't just stand behind somebody on the queue. Ask them, do you know where you are going? Have you seen any vision? Is this year going to be better? Are you going to make progress? Or is this what you want last year? I think I saw you there last year. And you're just marking time. Hey, I will not stand behind you. Don't stand be behind people that have no vision. Don't allow them to mislead you. And don't allow them to waste your life by just following after the people that do not know the place they are going. Thank God I know where I'm going. I know what I'm doing, and I will do that that will give me progress in the vision of the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. Look at Matthew chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. These people draw his nice unto me with their mouths and honoreth me with their leaves, but their heart is far from me. Those are the people, no vision, they're visionless, and they're and they not valiant for the truth. They're not valiant for what is right. They're just there, just existing and occupying space for nothing. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Teach him for doctrines they have not heard from God. Teach him for doctrine they have not listened to God. Teach him for doctrine the commandments of men. Their lives will not be rewarded in eternity, but they are happy to be like that because of the vanity of the visionless workmen. In Second Corinthians chapter six, Second Corinthians chapter six, we're reading from verse one. Second Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 1. It says in Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, this is what is written to our visionless people, about people that do not even think of planning their lives, having progress, they hear, they do nothing about it. The Lord speaks to them, they do nothing about it. They hear messages that will set them on fire. They do nothing about it as they were last year, so they are this year. And what is the hope? That 2020 will come and go and see a change in their lives and see a change in their commitments. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. We then, as workers together with him. Are you ever conscious that you are workers together with the Lord? That the Lord wants to walk with you and you ought to be committed in working for the Lord. Well, if you are working with Him, 
you'll be a man of vision, a woman of vision. You'll not be at a standstill. You'll not be doing merry go round. You'll not be going in the wilderness 40 years without making any progress with them as workers together with him. Beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Have you heard of people have the grace of God, all the grace of God? What are you doing with that grace? Saved by grace, what's the evidence of that salvation? Converted by grace, what's the evidence of that conversion? And you have been taught the word of the Lord by grace, what is the evidence of that teaching? You have heard God, and you're working together with God, and you have the grace of God, what is the evidence that God has more impact in your life than men and women around you. Receive not the grace of God in vain. If you have the grace of God, you'll be living in faithfulness. You'll be living by faith. You'll be living to bear fruit. You'll be progressing in the things of the Lord. If you're walking with God, He'll be talking to you. He'll be talking with you. He'll be directing you. He knows the souls to reach. And he knows the places to go. If you are workers together with God, and you have not received the grace of God in vain, he'll point them to you. Talk to that one. I prepare his heart. Talk to that one. I prepare the heart. Go to Saul of Tarsus. Behold, he prayed. He will direct you to Cornelius. He'll direct you to people. If you are workers together with God, if you have not received the grace of God in vain, have you got the grace for sanctification? What is the evidence? Have you got the grace for humility? What is the evidence? Have you got the grace to totally trample on pride in your life? What is the evidence? Have you got the grace that you are walking together with God? And whatever you do, you do by the faith of the Son of God who loves you and gave himself for you. Where is the evidence? We must have the grace of God. You'll have the grace of God. I will have more of the grace of God. Look at verse 3. Give me no offense in anything. Give me no offense in anything. If you have the grace of God, and if you have not received the grace of God in vain, you will not be an offense to the children in anything. You will not be an offense to your own children in anything. You'll not be an offense to somebody who's seeking the way of salvation in any sin. You'll not be an offense to backsliders. And as you know, you meet some backsliders, you say, Why don't you come back? The Lord loves you. Yes, I know the Lord loves me. I'm afraid to come back to that place. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid of so and so. Because, you know, it's an oppressor, it's a persecutor. I want to come back, but so and so is an offense to me. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, and in distresses. Those are the people that have vision and the people that are not vain, you will not be vain. I will not be vain. And your message will not be vain. Your lifestyle will not be vain. You will not just be you know, a redundant person in the house of God. And the grace of God, we cannot see the evidence in your life. We are looking at First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Not I am not what I was. He didn't say, by the grace of God, I am what I was. As you look at some people, you have to be praying for them. You have to be interceding for them. Because they are what they were. Careless. Unconcerned. Fleshly, lusting, bad character, bad habit, and they are not doing the work of God. 
and they stand in that place and they do not allow other people to move on ahead of them. And everybody is going behind them. And they are slow. And they are sluggish. And they are slothful. Paul the apostle didn't say, By the grace of God, I am what I was. It does not take grace to be what you were. It does not take grace to be at a standstill. It does not take grace to be as old as you were in the old year, in this new year. But it takes grace to be what you ought to be. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. We can ask you, Osman, any change this new year? Or is the man still as old in anger? The man still as old in fury? The man still as old in being stingy? Is he still what he was? We can ask your husband. Is the woman, is the wife, the way she was? And what she always did, she started it again this new year. Anytime she wants to get something, then she will withdraw. There's no talking. There's no food. And there's no chair. And there's no cheerfulness. Nothing at all. And she's there. You can see the quiet anger until you apply the old method of the carrot. What do you want, dear? How can I help you? Looks like you have come back, gone back into the old ways. And then I want this. Why didn't you talk? Let it be a new year. You want something? Come and say, my husband is what I want. Would you mind if I took this? Would you mind if you gave me this? Don't use the old method. Don't be as you were. Let there be a change. The same thing, we were children of God. Any good thing we get, we get by faith. And we get my love. And the Lord is saying, in this new year, have a new vision. And have what you ought to have in the normal way, straightforward manner. So you can say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Praise the Lord. A new man, a new minister, a new wife, a new husband, a new worker. Not somebody who will be using the method of the world to do something in the house of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Paul, tell me, how do you know that? Uh -uh. I don't go into houses to persecute anybody anymore. I don't uh, take those men and women, put them in the prison anymore. I've cut off from all those people of authority that used to give me letters to go and arrest Christians. I've not received the grace of God in vain. In fact, people have seen now that my life has changed. My comportment has changed. Everything about me has changed. My friends, if you're still using the method of the world, the way you were in the world, how you used to suppress people, oppress people, and conquer people, and crush people, so you can walk on them and have your way, you've got the grace of God in vain. Not to get the grace of God in vain will mean there's a new life now, a new stamina now, and a new vibrance in your life, and you're moving on now with the power of God. But I labored more abundantly than they all. You will labor. I said you will labor. I've discovered that some people that say those extraneous amens, it's just habit. What they did in the previous year, they do in the new year. And when you check up on them, the message is not bearing fruit in their lives. But I pray for you that all those old, old methods and all, all, all those old, old things that have been corrected will be totally corrected in your life in Jesus' name. It says, for I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Look at verse 58, verse 58, 
Look at this. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Not giving excuses this year. I'm tired now. What if I said to you, I'm tired? I'm probably older than you are. What if I said, I have this challenge, I have this challenge? What if I said, I don't have all the encouragement I need to have? What if I said that the more I love them, some people, not everybody, the less I am loved? What if I then hold back and everybody is switching and they say, where is pastor? And they say, pastor is tired today, I will not be tired. I said, I will not be tired. If you don't want me to, to be tired, I said, I will not be tired. And you will not be tired too. I said, you will not be tired too. That your life will take on a new splendor, and a new strength, and a new vision, and a new power. And you will be what you ought to be in Jesus' name. Old methods gone. Old cranky craftiness gone. Old lifestyle gone. And old disobedience gone. The grace of God more in your life. The power of God more in your life. And the goodness of God more in your life this new year. In Jesus' name. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. You will not be moved. The winds that blow will not move you. The things that happen, temptations, trials, will not move you. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much, look at this, look at this, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor will not be in vain. My labor will not be in vain. It will minister the grace of God in your life. The strength of God in your life. 2020 vision in your life. 2020 strength in your life. 2020 commitment in your life. You'll not be vain. You'll not have vanity. You'll not be visionless. I said you'll not be visionless. Look at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 9. Galatians chapter 4. We're looking at verse 9. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather, are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. You know what Paul was telling the people in the churches of Galatia, in the province of Galatia? He was telling them, you are with beggarly elements, you are with worldly things, and your life was earthly and worldly. And all those things you observe, look at verse 10, you observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you. Lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. When you go back to your old ways, it means the last retreat was in vain in your life. When you go back to your old ways, it means the last congress was in vain in your life. When you go back to the old method and to the old dullness and to the old lethargy, and to the old religious ways of doing things. And there's nothing new. No new life. No new zeal. No new commitment. No new obedience. No new consecration. It means everything you've got, the people that labored over you, they labored in vain. I'm afraid of you in verse 11. Lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. The labor of the people of God over you will not be in vain. Our labor will not be in vain. And your own labor too will not be in vain in Jesus' name. How do you love it? You send your children to school. 
you rake all the money you have, and then you send that child to school for marijuana. They just pushed her to primary two because they wanted to create space for all the children. Primary two, they just pushed her to primary three until primary six now. She cannot even write a simple sentence. And to write her name is a challenge. Are you happy with that? If that happened to your child, would you be happy with that? The same thing if you're a child of God. The same thing if you're a worker. And you're still in the rudiments. And all that you're learning, it doesn't show. All that you're learning doesn't lift you up doesn't move you forward, doesn't make you to have a new sight, a new vision, a new strength, a new power, a new excitement, a new enlightenment, a new understanding of the word, a new obedience to the word of God, that you're still the same as you were when you first came in. Of course, God will not be happy. I pray that things will be done in such a way the Lord will be happy with us. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. The children of Israel, after one year, five years, ten years, thirty years in the wilderness, they kept on murmuring. Forty years, they kept on murmuring. And there are people like that too. They are vain because they are visionless. They are not looking at the place we're going. They are not looking at the land of promise. As they murmured before, they're still murmuring today. As they disputed before, they're still disputing today. I pray that things will change. That I pray things will change. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the words of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. Look at this. That I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. If, uh, you know, the minister is laboring and there is no evidence of transformation, that's laboring in vain. If there's no evidence of respect for God, respect for the word of God, and respect for the minister of God, that means we are laboring in vain on you. And if there is no evidence of sanctification, a cleansed heart, a pure heart, and there is no evidence of standing squarely and solidly on the word of God, and is still the same old man, old pride, that should have been crucified. If that old pride has not been crucified, it means we are laboring in vain. We will not labor in vain. There will be a change. There will be a transformation. And there will be a new life and a new lifestyle and a new will and a new strength serving the Lord without looking back in Jesus' name. First Timothy chapter 3. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 5. First Thessalonians chapter 3. We're reading from verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I said to know your face, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. When our hearers cannot overcome temptation, temptation comes to them. Temptation to disobey God comes to them. They cannot overcome that temptation. Temptation to be like the world comes to them. 
they cannot overcome that temptation. They are like the world. Temptation to be the old self, the old man, the old woman comes to them. They cannot overcome that temptation. It means we are laboring in vain. Paul the apostle said, when I could not forbear, I wanted to know. All that were suffered, everything we went through, all that were preached unto them. I wanted to see the fruit so that I would know they have not yielded to the tempter. I will have labored in vain. You will not labor in, labor in vain. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith, good tidings of your charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us, always desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, who are comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. I pray that will be your testimony. Point number three now, the vocation of virtuous watchmen. The vocation of virtuous watchmen. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that she walk worthy of the vocation where we is, ye are called. You are called to repentance. Walk worthy of that repentance. You are called unto righteousness. Walk worthy of that righteousness. We are called unto holiness. Walk worthy of that holiness. We are called to the service of God. And as servants of God, walk worthy like the people that have a vision of the Lord. The Lord has revealed himself unto you. And because of that vision, and because of your response to that vision, you know what you are called to, and you know how you are called, and you know to what kind of life you are called. Repentance, righteousness, holiness, purity, and a life of zeal unto the Lord, and your walk worthy of that vocation wherewith ye were called. I follow that word that he has called you. He has called us. And we need to walk according to the calling he has given us. In Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 6, Romans Chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified. What's he? Our old man, our old hardness of heart, crucified with him. Our old pride, crucified with him. Our old stubbornness, crucified with him. Our old self, crucified with him. Our old nature crucified was him, knowing this, that our old man is crucified was him, that the body of sin, the nature of sin, the propensity to sin him, and the very root of sin might be destroyed, that his force we should not serve sin. We cannot serve the Savior and sin at the same time. We cannot serve self and the shepherd at the same time. We have to hate one, reject one, throw off one, and then hold on to the other. That we should not serve sin. Sin will try to introduce itself that we should not nurse sin. Sinful ways will present themselves again in this new year, like in the old year, we should not, not nurture sin, nourish sin. 
we shall not grow sin. We shall not feed sin. We shall not promote sin. We shall not welcome sin. Stab it to death. You know, if you have a dangerous animal in a cage, and you say, do I get rid of this dangerous animal? Stab it. Don't give it food. Lock it up there. Don't let it come out to see the light of day and to pounce some people and to destroy people. Just leave it there. Stab it to them. What do you do with the old man? Stab the old man. Don't feed the old man. Don't give attention to the old man. Don't nourish, don't nurse the old man. Don't appreciate the old man. What do you do to the old pride? Don't serve it. Don't nurture it. Don't nurse it. Don't welcome it. Don't demonstrate it. Don't give it a chance to live in your life. What do you do to sell? Don't nurse it. Don't nurture it. Don't feed it. Don't welcome it. Don't promote it. That we should not serve sin. That's how to make that old life die. The old life will die. The old self will die. The old sin will die. You know that uh, woman that's always wanting to get to attention. And you know privately in your heart, when she gets to attention, it gets to a problem. Problem of holiness. Problem of not thinking straight, not thinking right. A problem of not living according to your inner conviction. What do you do to the relationship? Stab it. Don't give attention. Out of sight, it has, it's out of mind. What do you do to, you know, the temptation that's always coming, always coming. Stab it. Stab it to death. Don't welcome it. Don't give attention to it. Don't nurse it. Don't nourish it. Don't feed it. Just stab it to death. And this year, you'll live a new life. New power. New strength. New ability. And pride that you know that used to come. So you pump up yourself. Don't give it attention. Stab that pride unto death. Crucify it. It comes up over and over and over in recurrent crisis. Just say, pride will not have the better part of me this year. You'll be free in Jesus' name. Galatians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 15. Galatians chapter 1. Reading from verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. What does that mean? He called me, though unworthy. He called me without my merit in it. He called me. He shouldn't have called me. I was the last person you'll think about. Paul said he should have called. Because I did evil, I went beyond almost my day of grace. But he called me all the same. Think about yourself. The privilege you have, should he have called you? To the position you have, should he have called you? If you are humble, and if you know the real truth about yourself, as God knows, you will know he shouldn't have called you. But he called you by his grace. He said to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. All the things, all the old things that will have held me back, tied me down, I conferred not with them. I made sure I responded. And now in the new life, in the new year, you'll keep on responding well in Jesus' name. Pride will say, I should have been called. I'm better than everybody else. I expected the Lord to call me. I expected the Lord to put me in that position. That's pride. That's pride. But humility will say, I know the truth. I know the reality. I do not merit anything. And because I know it's not by marriage, that's why I'm going to show gratitude to the Lord. That 
His grace in me will not be in vain. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Anything you do, anything you teach, any life you live, any teaching you give, any preaching you give, anywhere you go, anyone you interact with, solely to show yourself approved unto God. Always be asking yourself, will God approve of this action? Or do I want to do anything not thinking of God? I don't want to think about God. I just want to do what I want to do. That will not be right. That will invite punishment in your life. Start to show thyself. Approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Are you doing something that if it came to light, you'll be ashamed? A man between a woman. Are you doing something that if it came to light, you'll be ashamed? A person, a certainty to money. Are you doing anything with money? your own money or the money of the church, that if it came to light, you'll be ashamed? What's your family? What's your daughter? What's your son? Are you doing anything that if it came to light, you'll be ashamed? With any member of the church, are you doing anything that if those things came to light, you'll be ashamed? Study to show thyself. Endeavor to show thyself. A workman, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. The Lord will help us. Look at chapter 3. In chapter 3 of Second Timothy, verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All that will live godly, how many godly people will suffer persecution? All. The ungodly will persecute the godly. The godly will never persecute the godly. The saint will never persecute another saint. A true minister of God will never persecute another true minister of God. A child of God, true child of God, will never persecute another true child of God for whatever reason. If anyone says he's a child of God and he persecutes another child of God, that persecutor is backsliding, is ungodly, is unrighteous. It's untruthful. It's unfaithful. It doesn't have heaven as a goal. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Who are the people that persecute them? Verse 13. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Deceivers are ungodly. Deceivers are righteous. Liars are ungodly. Liars are righteous. They are not heavenly minded. If they die as deceivers, they will not go to heaven, which is made for the godly. Verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. I will continue. I said, I will continue. Persecution may come. I will continue. Disappointment might come. I will continue. Whatever happens, whatever does not happen, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. You will continue. I will continue. Say it well now. By grace to continue, the Lord will give you in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 4, verse, four, chapter, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God, from all you have heard, all you have been hearing, 
or you are still hearing, I chuck thee therefore before God on the strength, on the note of every word you have heard, I chuck thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead the living and the dead. He'll bring everything to judgment, everyone to judgment. Always live in view of the judgment day. Live in view of what will happen when all your secret life will be brought into the open. He'll judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Don't be unfaithful. Preach the word. Don't say, because if I preach that, I will kind of expose myself. Preach the word. If there's, if there's anything in, in your life that will hinder you from preaching the word, that you will not be faithful to preach the word so that you are not exposed, then quickly come out of the pulpit and tell the people that have authority over you who are pastors over you, leaders over you, there's something in my life that will not allow me to preach the totality of the word of God now. Because of this, because of this, because of that, I'm not qualified so quietly. I want to withdraw. That will be the path of honor. Rather than you are there, you cannot preach the word. If I preach restitution, Somebody is there in the congregation, and he'll say, uh-huh, so you know restitution. I bought my money. If I preach one man, one wife, and there's no messing around with half a wife somewhere else, half an husband somewhere else, if I preach that, that lady will say, ah, so you knew that. And then you are coming to me and you are doing this and that. If you know you cannot preach the word without feeling ashamed and guilty, then step aside. But when your life has been taken to Calvary and the blood of Christ has washed you clean and you can stand and you are clean and you are righteous and you are purged, and you are purified, and that life is so clean that even heaven will affirm your life is clean. Then you can come and say, I'm all right now. I can preach now without shame and without guilt. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove rebuke, exhort without long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own laws shall they heap to themselves teachers have been itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth you will not turn your ears away from the truth I've known people in the past. I don't, you know, the congregation is far away from me now, so I cannot see them, what they do. But in the past, when the congregation was so near and I could see them, we mentioned something in the Word of God, and then it strikes somebody. And instead of uh, repenting before the Lord, they close their Bibles. For the rest of the message, they will not open the Bible. And if you ask them why, he's preaching at me. He's using me to preach. And because he's using me to preach, therefore I'm not going to listen anymore. They turn their ears away from the truth. You will not turn your ears away from the truth. Because you will know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And if you turn your ears away from the truth, are you going to be free? But in the midst of that, even when some people turn their ears away from the truth, in verse 5, it says, But watch thou in all things, watch thou in all things, endure affliction, endure affliction. If you preach and then affliction comes because of that, endure. Somebody there say, I will endure. 
Let me hear you. You know, some few years ago, not so many, but some years ago, I was preaching and preaching and preaching. And then I just said, look at that. You have 3,000 uh, naira at that time. Naira was, you know, of much value. And then you spend, I analyzed the 3,000 naira. You spend it this way and this way and this way. And now you're saying, you're praying, you're saying, pray for me. I need money, pray for me. I need money. How did you spend your money like that? I didn't know there was somebody there who had 3,000 naira and who uh, spent it this way, this way, exactly the way I said. I was just preaching. And then at the end of the meeting, that time I used to wait behind to see people. The fellow came and said, um, excuse me, pastor. Oh, I said, uh, how are you? Uh, she said, can you, uh, I need money. Can you lend me 3,000 uh, naira? Oh, I said, you know, I don't have that kind of money. If I had, of course, I'll not even lend you. I will give you. Say, uh-huh, uh-huh, there you are. You know how to preach. You know how to preach. Somebody had 3,000 naira and then spent it this way, this way. And that woman poured a lot of, you know, language, unprintable language on me. Then I realized what happened. All that I was talking about, the Spirit of God was talking to her. And she didn't want to yield. And I endured affliction. But thank God I'm still alive. I said I'm still alive. Some years ago, I was preaching and preaching and preaching. I think it was, a, you know, a weekend a meeting. And I said, here you are. You are your problem. Nobody is uh, driving you. If you park from, I mentioned the place, and you park to, I mentioned the place, the problem you are running away from, you'll still meet it where you are running to. And then, um, after the meeting, she came to me. And I didn't know anything about her that she passed from here to there. And she said, now, I know that you are the one trailing me. You are my problem. And she began to insult me. I told the husband, hear what your wife is saying to me, the pastor. The husband said, yes. Why she, would she not say that? When you said this and said this and said this. And then I knew that the preaching was their problem. They turned their ears away from hearing the truth. I kept quiet, allowed all the insult, because it says, watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. After a few weeks, that woman came back with the husband and knelt down. And I said, what was happening? She had a dream in their family. In that dream, there were three of them. And the devil wanted to kill the three of them. And then I appeared in that dream. And I told that devil, don't touch this one. She comes to my church. And uh, eventually, within a few weeks, those other two people died in their family, and she remained alive. And then she came, you are not my problem, you are my pastor, you are my shepherd, you are the one praying for me, and you are the one protecting me. You know, the Lord will bring it out at his own time, but preach the word. Don't allow affliction, persecution, what they say against you, don't allow that to move you at all. You will stand for the truth this new year. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. You make proof of your ministry this new year in Jesus' name. 2020 vision. You'll be a 2020 vision worker. A 2020 vision minister. A 2020 vision witness. A 2020 vision house leader. A 2020 vision watchman, watchwoman in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's rise up, talk to the Lord in prayer. Without vision, the people perish. People in your community will perish without vision. Tell the Lord, open your mouth and tell the Lord, Oh Lord, give me the right vision. People dying, people perishing, people going to hell, where there's no vision, the people perish. Your relatives, your relations, your neighbors, your co-tenants, your co-workers, 
the people around you. If you don't have a vision, the people will perish. I've done with lesser things. Abandon unimportant things. Don't spend your life on things redundant, things unimportant. Have a vision from the Lord. Write the vision. Record the vision. That he that readeth may run, and he that runneth may read. Catch the vision. Don't let the word of God be in vain in your life. Always acting the way you have always acted. No vision. Also getting whatever you want to get by force. No faith. By hatred, no love. Always wanting to have your way. Stubbornness and disobedience. Have a new way. Surrender your will. Crush that old pride. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. What is no vision? Your life will be bogged down by non essentials, little, little things. You'll be picking faults, picking holes in the message. You were like an old, old, incorrigible man. Old, old, incorrigible woman. Not valiant for the truth. Petty, petty, petty things. Where is your attention? Come out of that. Is the vision the Lord showed to Ananias that made him go to Paul, Saul of Tarsus without wasting time? What vision have you got for the new year? Is this January the same as last year, April, May, and June? Any new life? Any new zeal? Any new consecration? Any new commitment? Any new humility? Any new surrender? Or old self is still on the throne? Old anger still on the throne. Old violence and fighting still on the throne. Old lifestyle. Crush other people's spirit so you can have your way. Old life. No vision. The Lord has not spoken to you this new year. You are receiving the message. You are receiving the grace of God in vain. Old language. Old action. Old behavior. 
old indulgence. Old talkativeness. Tell the Lord where there is no vision, the people perish. It's not enough to have workers. If the workers don't have vision, our neighbors will perish. Our communities will perish. If you receive the word and it doesn't come with new fire, new fervency, you're just becoming like you keep coming and sinners around you will perish. Backsliders around you will perish. Tell the Lord, recreate me, remold me, renew my life and renew my heart. Let the old lukewarmness vanish away. The old coldness vanish away. The old unfaithfulness vanish away. Tell the Lord, old lifestyle vanish away. Old incorrigibility vanish away. Bring yourself back to the altar. Be valiant. Be valiant. Valiant for the truth. Valiant for sound scriptural conviction. Valiant for essential things in ministry. Not valiant for non-essentials. Valiant for sound doctrine. Valiant for good understanding. Valiant for loving other people. Valiant for sacrificing. Sacrificing instead of indulging. Valiant for self discipline. Valiant for the truth. Don't be vain in your comportment, your lifestyle. Don't be vain. Your reaction to the word of God. Be full of gratitude. I'm so grateful to God. He called me by His grace. Reciprocate. I'm so grateful. He called me. Didn't abandon me in the wilderness of the world. Be faithful. The vocation where we to are called. Be faithful. New consecration this new year. New commitment this new year. New dependability that the Lord can depend on you this new year. Faithfulness. Endure affliction. Endure affliction. Be 
whatever persecution you suffer, as a result of being faithful, preaching the word, don't mind. That's part of our calling. Men may hate you, throw your name away, don't mind. That's part of suffering persecution for what you believe. If you can't suffer for what you say you believe, you don't really believe what you say you believe. Be a man of conviction, a woman of conviction, willing and ready to suffer for your conviction. Be an evangelist. Be a soul winner. Be a teacher of the word. The Lord has given you the responsibility. Call them out of sin to the Savior. And when they profess conversion, prepare them for the rapture. Prepare them for Christ's coming. Prepare your converse for heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. And the whole church said, Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you because in this new year, you want us to have a vision. A vision for serving you. A vision to reach out to people around us. A vision to bring sinners into the kingdom. A vision to disciple the believers and the converts. I will pray none of us will fail in Jesus' name. We are praying, Lord, new strength you gave unto us. New vision you gave unto us. New conviction you gave unto us. New backbone and stamina you gave unto us in Jesus' name. New courage. New boldness. A new sacrifice and consecration give to everyone in Jesus' name. We pray that none of us will receive your grace in vain. We'll not receive all these teachings and the truth and the enlightenment and impartation. We'll not receive in vain in Jesus' name. And we pray that everything you have revealed unto us will grant us the faithfulness to go out and reveal to other people and bring them into your kingdom in Jesus' name. For those who have restitution to make, for those who have things to set right in their families, in their profession, in their personal lives, in the church, the grace to stand firm and to stand right, like Abimelech did, and he did that restitution promptly and immediately and cheerfully, wholeheartedly. Give that grace to everyone in Jesus' name. We pray will not come here in vain will not serve you in vain. We will not be in the new year with an old character, an old comportment in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that this year will be a fruit, will be a more fruit, will be a much fruit into your kingdom in Jesus' name. Give us more power. Give us more strength. Give us more enlightenment. Give us more fire in our hearts in Jesus' name. 
and help us to be faithful in little things and faithful in major things and faithful in the private and faithful in the public in Jesus name. We pray Lord who will always be walking like men and women of vision. Men and women of passion. Men and women of mission. And men and women of conviction. As we go back home, go with us, Lord, and help us as we meditate upon your word. We pray you enlighten us the more. We will not remain the same. Your power will increase in our lives. Your faithfulness will increase in our lives. We'll be more and more fruitful as we go on every day in this new year in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray.